The earliest astronomers noticed something unusual about our solar system. They noticed that the planets and the moons and the sun all seemed to be moving on the same plane. Yeah, they understood that the universe was three-dimensional, but they wondered why our neighborhood is seeming to be in 2D. They thought our planet and the other planets and the sun must be related in some way. We must have come from the same place. The Earth and stuff. The Earth and stuff about the Earth and stuff. The Earth and stuff about the Earth and stuff. The Earth and stuff about the Earth and other things. So last week we talked about the Big Bang, element production inside stars, and planted the elementary seeds for our solar system. This week, we're going to talk about the formation of our solar system and of our planet. How do we get from a cloud of mostly gas to eight planets orbiting around a star? And why is Earth the only house in the neighborhood with running water? And where did our poetry inspiring moon come from? Let's start here, a solar nebula. A collection of mostly gas with some particles of dust sprinkled in bouncing around randomly, but with the slightest net rotation. It's composed almost entirely of hydrogen and helium gas, with just a sprinkling of heavier elements which we call were made inside stars and supernovas. Gravity is the name of the game here, and it drives the majority of the material towards the center of the solar nebula. Now, just like a figure skater pulls in his or her arms to spin faster, as more material moves towards the center of the nebula, its spin velocity increases. As the spin velocity increases, the cloud begins to flatten into a disk. It's kind of like tossing a pizza dough in the air and spinning it around and it flattens out. As the density of the center of the nebula increases, particles begin to bounce around and bunch into each other. This is the conversion of gravitational energy into kinetic energy, or heat. The center continues to heat up until the temperature reaches around 10 million Kelvin at which point it becomes a proper star with nuclear fusion. Now, virtually all of the mass in the solar system is contained within the sun, with just a few percent left to build everything else. All this collapsing and rotating cause all kinds of heat, but eventually it begins to cool back down, and things start to condense into solid. But it depends on where you are in the solar system. In the inner solar system, close to the sun, you only can condense out rock minerals and metals. While in the outer solar system, it's cool enough to condense rock minerals, metals, and ices. The solid particles start bumping into each other and making bigger particles, and random collisions keep happening and eventually they get big enough to have their own gravitational pulls, which of course causes even more objects to slam into them, eventually making things called planetesimals. This process is called accretion, the building of tiny particles into planetesimals. Becoming a planetesimal does not guarantee you'll become a planet. In fact, the fate of many planetesimals is to be later integrated into other planets, or moons, or become moons themselves, or just simply just drift throughout the solar system as castaways. Now, just as the collapse of the sun causes it to heat up, the collapse of planetesimals causes them to heat up as well, with collapsing and impacts, but also an important source of heat is radioactive elements trapped within the planetesimals. If a planetesimal gets big enough, it eventually drives a process called differentiation, where the heavier elements, like iron, can move to the center of a planet, while the lighter elements, like oxygen or silicon, can float to the top. Also helping to drive this differentiation is the fact that metal and silicate don't mix very well, like oil and water. Oil and water, even if shaken well, will eventually separate out from one another. They are immiscible. Alternatively, alcohol and water which also have different densities, are miscible, meaning once mixed, they stay mixed, which is handy for many reasons. Anyway, the density and immiscibility differences result in layers in our planet with sharp boundaries, something we have verified extensively with geophysics, which we'll also talk about in a later lesson. Elsewhere in the solar system, other planets are undergoing this same process, accretion and differentiation. What your final planet is made of is highly dependent on its relative position to the sun. You see, the inner planets are rocky and don't have much gas, while the outer planets have a lot more gas. 
the inner planets, being closer to the hot sun during formation, would have lost most of their volatile elements and molecules, while the outer planets, being much further away, were in conditions cool enough to retain many of their volatiles. Now let's quickly make sure we're all on the same page with volatility in this context. Volatility is the tendency of a substance to vaporize, to go from liquid or solid to gas. For example, gasoline is very volatile, which is why if you leave it in an open container, it'll evaporate really quickly and why it smells so much. By comparison, this banana isn't very volatile at all. In fact, I'm going to take my time while eating it and I don't have to worry about it evaporating out of my hand. Now remember that volatility is temperature and pressure dependent, meaning there is a temperature at which this banana is volatile. So what does that mean for planet formation? It means that solar system development, like real estate development, is all about location, location, location. What your planet is made of is highly dependent on its relative position to your sun. You may have even heard of the habitable zone concept before. The habitable zone is a range of orbits around a star inside which liquid water can exist given enough atmospheric pressure. Lucky for us, Earth is inside this zone, obviously. However, it is a bit more complicated than that when it comes to having liquid water on the surface of your planet. Your distance from the sun, the size and brightness and type of star your sun is, the size of your planet, the thickness and composition of your atmosphere, and reflectivity of your planet's atmosphere and surface are all important factors. So we have water, but where exactly did it come from? Did it come with accretion or did it arrive later with meteorites? The answer has important implications for solar system evolution and planet formation, and there is good scientific evidence for both possibilities. Keep in mind that we aren't the only place in the solar system with water, and in fact, as far as water inventory goes, we don't even have the most. We're pretty sure Europa has twice as much water as we do. Now you might be wondering, how do we know all of this? I mean, how do we know that it was a cloud and then it condensed and little bits smashed into other little bits and they became bigger bits and then, then it differentiated. How do we know all of this? That's a great question, buddy. Thanks for asking. We know because we have samples. Roughly 50,000 meteorites impact our planet every year. And lots of them are burnt up in the atmosphere and many more go into the ocean, but we still find hundreds of them every year. And these little meteorites are samples of the early solar system. Bits of material that were never integrated into a planet. We know these space rocks are samples of the early solar system not only because of how old they are, and they are the oldest objects we've found in our solar system, but because they have a characteristic texture that simply isn't found on Earth, or the Moon, or Mars. And if that wasn't enough, we can use our space telescopes to gaze upon young solar systems in our own galaxy to give us further insights into solar system formation. That said, our understanding of solar system formation and solar system evolution is not without questions, and researchers continue today to try and better understand this period of history. The entire process, from solar nebula to fully formed planets and stars, took hundreds of millions of years to happen. There is ongoing scientific debates about the process in each step, and even the steps themselves. But understand, this brief hypothesis that I've covered is the widely accepted model today. But new data could change our understanding. So we made the Earth, but what is the Earth made of? It's actually pretty simple. This, this is convenient. This is it. You got some oxygen, some silicon, magnesium, a little calcium and aluminum, some sodium, and only 3.4% left for everything else. Which is incredible if you consider this. All life as we know it needs at least these six elements to exist. They're often abbreviated as schnapps. You can't have life without schnapps, peeps. Now, of course, Earth has plenty of oxygen, but these other five elements make up just 0.0086% of Earth's mass. All life as we know it, every dinosaur, every bird, every backstreet boy needs these five elements. Not a lot to work with in terms of abundance, but look at the biologic diversity we have and have had as a result. It's genuinely amazing. Now, before we wrap up, I promise to tell you where our moon came from. 
Well, it came in part from us. You see, as best we understand it, the moon is a result of an impact between Earth and something sized similarly to Mars, very early in Earth's history. This is supported by numerous lines of evidence, including the age of the moon versus meteorites, the relative elemental abundances of the moon versus meteorites and Earth, and the ratio of volatile elements to non-volatile elements. This impact hypothesis is the preferred model of moon formation, though it is still subject to scientific debate. So that's it, peeps. We're done with the beginning. We made all the elements, we made our solar system and our planet and our moon, and from now on, we're gonna remain firmly grounded on this planet, mostly. Now, next week, we're gonna do some light chemistry review, which I'll promise I'll try to make as painless as possible, but no promises. Promise, but no promises. That's how that promise works. If you have any questions, as always, please ask them in the comments below. Thanks for watching. See you next week, peeps. That's it. You can, uh, I'm going to keep saluting. That's all I got. I got nothing else. That's the most interesting way I have to say goodbye. That's it. Four percent left for everything else. <laughs> I'm going to go up some better than that.